being too frail or kidney stone disease was one contraindication. And we previewed patients with a two to three day trial diet just to make sure they could stand it. Okay? So the protocol was 28 days under nutritionist guidance, restricting carbs as much as we could, which was about 5% of energy. They had weekly visits to our uh, clinic where we got bloods, particularly as another measure of compliance to measure their ketone body levels in the blood exam history. And if they lost more than 5% of their baseline weight, they would have to be considered discontinuation from the study. The rationale for one month duration was principally the last. We wanted to give patients a reasonable chance to succeed. But in addition, I mean, because diet is not easy no matter what diet you try, but almost anybody can stay on a diet for a month. So that was the practical. Ketosis starts within three to four days. Nibbling it all from that human study showed effects in eight weeks. And uh, PET scan effects can be shown as early as one week. So we figured it's reasonable to try something like that. And we just completed our 10th patient a couple of, about a month ago. And these are the results. 10 patients completed the trial safely, so objective one was achieved. There were no adverse effects due to the diet. Five of, well, let me just start off with the bad news, is that five of the, all patients came in with progressive disease. And five of them continued to have progressive disease. But on the other hand, five patients showed stable disease. Actually, four showed stable disease, and one showed a partial remission using published criteria for assessing uh, uh, effects of a diet. So this is not really outside of my expectations. As I say, I didn't expect that all patients would be responsive to this. Uh, Excuse me. Yes? Were those patients all hospitalized? No, the these were patients. Were so they were at home, they came in weekly, they were getting nutritional counseling. Yes, some of the issues that are going to come up in the paper are going to be the degree of compliance and how we measure that, and basic proximity rate levels and so forth. And the summary is that it's a dietary intervention rather than drugs. Uh, ten patients were completed without adverse effects. The plausible metabolic mechanisms as well as molecular mechanisms. And we want to explore further which cancers in which patients are likely to be susceptible so we can improve patient selection. And that's about it. I spoke very fast. I know. Did you measure uh, calories consumption? Mm -hmm. Calorie consumption? Yeah. We did, yes. Again, did after the question? Oh, sorry. Uh, whether calorie consumption was measured, yes. I mean, by food recall. So, you know, some of this is going to be precise. Other question was whether we're, we have any assurance of compliance. And probably the best assurance we're going to have is measurement of ketosis. We did blood measurements. <laughs> Cancer cells are just, um, they express um, transporters on their surface that allow them to take in glucose very easily. So even though you reduce your glucose serum concentrations modestly on a low-carb diet, um, cancer cells will still have constant high glucose uptake. Cancer cells will not reduce their glucose uptake. So they're going to they're going to suck, suck glucose out of your blood anyway. The question though is that then permits them to have constant supply of glucose, which enables the possibility that if they metabolize fatty acids and ketone bodies, that there could be an addition of glycolysis in the Randall cycle. Now the ketones are produced through the metabolism of fats, right? As well as protein. Well, ketone bodies are usually thought to be a result of uh, just uh, lack of insulin. So it's, it's really a fat metabolism, a byproduct of fat metabolism. Yeah. I, have, I have a good friend who had a sadly more than my wife. Um, she was wasting very rapidly, and just out of my personal knowledge and strength, I suggested maybe she start drinking protein shakes with me and change her glycerides. She put on it 10 pounds or so. Um, I, I was assuming I was helping her feed the healthy tissue. I mean, I, you say you can't starve your cancer by, by reducing your carbs, and I get that. But can you selectively feed your healthy tissue? Well, that's what we think we're doing. Yes. But, I mean, this is very, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm saying this with, you know, I'm obviously enthusiastic about this, yeah, but sure. but the, the reality is this is still a very, very yeah. preliminary stage. I just because, figured it wasn't going to hurt her anyway. Yeah, well, you know. I'll t I mean, I'll just give you a couple of the things that, that we have to be cautious about. One of them is that 
Um, some of the stimulation for cell growth is not just caused by insulin. Proteins, and particularly branched chain amino acids, stimulate cell growth. And so it may also be necessary, and I'm again speculating, that a diet that, might be that needs to be tailored to a cancer patient may not just need to be carbohydrate restricted, but also restricted in certain culprit amino acids, perhaps methionine has been suggested, or, or uh, you know. You think it's, they were just not taking them in the right amounts, in the right proportions? Yeah, the, 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 the may not be one specific, but the way we're yeah. matching them together. Right, it may be that the balance of amino acids has to be different. Uh, I've read a number of articles that speculated <clears throat> on the possibility that uh, anti the use of antioxidants may uh, uh, speed cancer growth. And based upon the uh, uh, glycolysis uh, of cancer cells, maybe that's correct. What do you think? I think it's, uh, it, you know, it's, there's just far too much con conflicting information out there to be able to draw. But I mean, uh, if you look of, if you think of uncoupling protein 2 as an antioxidant, then maybe it's, uh, it has a balance. What it's going to do is it's going to prevent apoptosis, but under certain circumstances it might still cause, you know, increase cell growth. So I don't really know. I actually asked biochemist biochemist, his thought was that it's the ratio of the antioxidants. What we may be doing is going off the balance. By taking too much of one, that actually may be hurting the production of others. And he thinks that it may be the ratios between what we're taking. Yeah. Was there any change in the patient's weights? Yeah, actually, um, these none of these. Well, three of the patients were actually at or near near you know uh, you know BMI within twenty to twenty to five, twenty to twenty five, but. Seven of them were, at, were you know, were over, were overweight, with high BMIs, mm -hmm. and all of the overweight patients lost weight. Mm -hmm. all right. But it wasn't really considered a clinical problem for them. But that the normal ones didn't. Now, no. One of the normal ones stayed weight stable. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not that surprising because the closer you come to normal weight, the harder it is to lose weight. Um, the other two, one lost about three percent of body weight, and one lost. Yeah, but they both lost about three percent. In terms of like trying to talk to like maybe dubious colleagues about this, like um, what about referencing studies and uh, other cultures that don't have cancers or the, 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 the low carb societies? Would that be useful to bring up that kind of um, that data to sort of convince people to take the low carb diet seriously, not just for, for um, treatment potentially, but for prevention as well? Yeah, I, I haven't. I've, I've tried to avoid getting into making. Uh, Claim. I mean, as it is, I, I, you know, uh, making claims about prevention. I mean, I'm very suspicious that cancer is, in fact, also related to an excess glucose and carbohydrates in the diet. And there's actually evidence that, you know, from Brownlee's lab at Einstein, where it might take off, that hyperglycemic spikes actually accentuate production of reactive oxygen species, which is now thought by many to be a final common insider of mutations in cells and causing degenerative disease, arthritis, you know, uh, atherosclerotic disease, as well as cancer. So the hyperglycemia may, in fact, contribute as well to, the, to, to, to cancer. But having said that, you would think that an epidemiologic study of, of, uh, of cultures that uh, eat uh, meat, you know, the Laplanders that eat reindeer meat all day long, and they, they don't eat anything, you know, they eat practically no carbohydrate or some Inuit societies. <coughs> But you know, these are also cultures that are don't really have access to medical information on autopsies and what you know what actually the cause of death. And my guess is that you know I don't want to go there without that information first. And second, if they developed cancers, they would be cancers that would be obviously resistant to carb restriction. So you know, again, it's an evolutionary issue. What I'm saying is that in our population, in the society that we live in, we don't have sustained ketosis. We have so that ketosis or other conditions relating to reduced carbohydrate is an alien metabolic environment for most cancers that evolve within 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 most in most humans. So and therefore some of them may be susceptible to it.